Thy strong word bespeaks the righteous, bright with Thine own holiness. Glorious now we press toward glory, and our lives our hopes confess. Alleluia. my friends so glad you can join us we're so happy that you're tuning in wherever you are uh, make sure you hit subscribe make sure you uh, share it with a friend or family member if you'd like to share a word of encouragement uh, let us know let us know how we have uh, how the word of God has impacted you and uh, please join me for a word of prayer gracious God our Heavenly Father we give you praise and thanksgiving we thank you that there's so much we can learn from you and we thank you that you also use children as, a, as examples for us to learn from. As we come before you today to learn about how to be childlike or the spiritual truths from children, we ask that you will speak to us, that you will guide us, that you will strengthen us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our risen glorious world Now reconciled is God my Lord The gates of heaven are open My Jesus did triumphant die And Satan's arrows broken lie Destroyed hell's fiercest weapon. Oh, hear what cheer Christ victorious, rising glorious, life is giving. He was dead, but now. Please join me for confession and absolution. Almighty God, who sent the promised Holy Spirit to fill disciples with willing faith, we confess that we resist the work of your Spirit among us, that we are slow to serve you and reluctant to spread the good news of your love. God, have mercy on us. Forgive our divisions, and by your Spirit draw us together. Create in us a desire to do your will and to be your faithful people for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading is recorded in Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter, beginning at the 7th verse. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word that I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved. 
Second reading is from Romans, the 13th chapter, beginning at the 8th verse. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. The Holy Gospel is recorded in St. Matthew, the 18th chapter, beginning at the 15th verse. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Greetings. So glad you can tune in. And just hit, remember, hit subscribe. Uh, share this with a fa friend or family member. And I pray that God's word will strengthen and bless you today. Well, a little boy named Johnny... Uh, wasn't feeling well, and so he went to the went to the pediatrician. And so in the doctor's office, um, the doctor tried to um, cheer him up, um, try to be funny with him. And so he takes up a otoscope and begins looking down his ears. As he's peeking down his ears, uh, the doctor says, "Johnny, Johnny, is Mickey Mouse in there?" Well, Johnny thought this was this was very childish. And so he doesn't respond. And then the, doctor, um, then the doctor takes a flashlight and he opens up Johnny's mouth and he shines the light inside and he tells him, say, ah, uh, Johnny, is, is Donald Duck in there? Well, again, jo Johnny thought this was uh, childish. Uh, so he doesn't say a word. Finally, um, the doctor gets a stethoscope out and he puts and he puts it on uh, Johnny's chest. He begins to listen, and once again he tries to be funny, and he says, "He says, Johnny, is Barney in there?" Well, finally Johnny speaks up. Johnny says, "Jesus is in my heart. Barney's on my underwear." Don't you love children? Um, they are so honest and. Uh, they are so real, and you know, there's and there's so much we can learn from them. Now, I want you to keep that in mind, um, because today we are going to talk about some spiritual lessons we can learn from children. So, what happened is that some background. The background, if you remember, um, the Jesus tour was in Caesarea Philippi, and so while they were there, while they were there. Um, it was there at a place with a big history, long history of idol worship. Uh, Jesus asked his disciples, who do others say I am? And then finally he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter replied for the group, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then after that, Jesus begins to, from that point on, begins to explain to them that he would have to go to Jerusalem. He would have to suffer under the hands of the religious leaders and finally die and rise again. But hearing that, Peter was upset. He told him, this is, this is never going to happen to you. This is never going to happen because, because in his mind, they... We're all so convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. He was about to set up his earthly kingdom here. He's going to be the king of Israel. He's going to drive the Romans out. And so Peter could not believe that. They were so convinced that he was the one. In fact, if you look at the signs 
the miracles and the wonders that he performed, there's no doubt. I mean, with five loaves and two small fish, he fed 5,000 households. I mean, did you know some scholars estimate that, um, that there could have been 20,000 people there that day? Wow. And there's another occasion where he fed, uh, fed uh, 4,000 households, and this time with a few small fishes and, some, and two loaves. I mean, wow, you know, how, how do you multiply food and feed thousands of people? And then he heals the blind. I mean, nobody heals the blind except the Messiah. In the Old Testament, no blindness has ever been healed. No one heals the blind except the Messiah. Then, I mean, you think about it, he raises the dead. I mean, all these signs and wonder. He walks on water. You know, nobody walks on water. There are so many of these signs and wonders to prove, to con you know, to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, the one. And so there was no way they could believe that Jesus was ever going to die or go to the cross. So after that discussion, they're on their way back, traveling from Mount Hermon back to Capernaum. Now on their way back, the disciples were so convinced Jesus was about to establish his kingdom. It's going to happen. He's going to take his throne. They're, go go they're going to rule with him. And so on the road back, they were already arguing amongst themselves who would be the greatest who would take Jesus' right hand? Who would sit on Jesus' right hand? Who would sit on Jesus' left hand? They were jogging for position. Well, Jesus heard that they were talking, and he asked them, what are you guys talking about? But because they were felt so guilty, they didn't say a word. Well, finally, they get back to Capernaum, where Jesus had moved from Nazareth to, you know, for ministry's sake. And now Jesus is in the house, and the disciples come to him. They're arguing again over who is the greatest, and they, they come before Jesus, wanting Jesus to settle it for them. And so this is where our text um, picks up. Matthew writes, chapter 18, verse 1, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now once again, they believe the kingdom is about to be established. Jesus is about to sit on the throne. And so they were ready to rule. They were looking forward to rule with Jesus. Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of God is what they asked Jesus. In response, verse 2, Jesus, saying, Jesus called a little child to him, placed a child among them, and said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So in ancient Jewish society, children were insignificant. They didn't have a voice. They were dependent upon adults. And so Jesus calls this child, and it's the, the text seems to tell us that Jesus and Mary living in a house in Capernaum there was this child that may be a relative who was living with them. And so he calls his child over. He lifts him up. He holds him. He holds the child, and he sits down with the child. And then he says those words, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Notice what Jesus says. Truly I tell you, that means pay attention. Pay attention. Listen. This is very, very important. Then he says, unless you change. Change what? Change your attitude. Change your thinking. Change your pursuit of being a top dog. Change your pursuit of, of power and prestige. Change your pursuit of riches. You need to change those pursuit. And and become like little children, or you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So you never met, so there's two things here. Number one, ch you change, he says change, 
and become like little children or you will never enter the kingdom of God. So what does it mean to be like children? Well, we know children are completely dependent upon adults for protection, for education, for sustenance, for shelter. A child cannot survive without an adult. And so a child can earn nothing. A child can receive everything. And so the disciples had to be reminded that they can't, before God, they can earn nothing. They can only receive from God. And so the first point I want to make is that we cannot earn it. We cannot earn it before God. Before God, I am poor. Before God, I can't earn it. Before God, I am nothing. You know, one of the hardest things for people to understand is that the forgiveness of sins and salvation is something that cannot be earned. It cannot be earned. A lot of people believe that, that, you, you, that you can do something, that maybe if you're good enough or, you're, or you're good, that your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you'll make it to heaven. But unfortunately, that's not, that's not the truth. You know, when I was back at the seminary uh, studying, you know, to be a pastor, at that time, I was taking a, an evangelism course, a you know, 10-week course on evangelism. Of course, we had reading, we had homework, we had papers to turn in, we had classwork, but we also had this weekend where we needed, where we were assigned to a neighborhood to talk to people about Jesus. Well, as soon as we arrived, I realized uh, this was inner city St. Louis. So, so inner city ministry, if you understand that concept, that means that if you go to the inner city in Chicago and other major cities, you'll realize what I, <laughs> what I mean when I was at in St. Louis, inner city St. Louis. Well, just look at one look at the neighborhood, I can tell you, Windows are boarded up in many of the houses. Not only were houses boarded up, there were graffiti uh, around the neighborhood, lots of graffiti. Um, this was not artwork per se. This, these were like markings of maybe gang-related signs. Then there were also trash everywhere. I mean, this was not a neighborhood that you would enjoy a Saturday morning's walk at, okay? It was like a war zone, okay? There are houses that are abandoned. And so after our briefing at the neighborhood church, we went out two by two to talk to people about Jesus. Well, we rang many doors and we were quite surprised that people actually came to answer the door. Well, well it also helped that we were in our clerical uniform. That is, we were wearing our black shirt with the collar, and because we were wearing it, we were, we were asked to wear it because by wearing our professional clothing, it, would, it told the neighborhood why we were there, that we were not undercover cops, we were not bounty hunters, we were there to share the good news. And so, I remember ringing a doorbell, and most of the conversation, all of the conversation, we would have to ask the person, why would God let you into heaven? And all of them, all of them, their response would be, well, I think I, I'm a good person. I try to do good. I try to be nice. I do try to do what is right. But wait a minute. What does the Bible say about that? You know, in Romans chapter six, verse 20, uh, chapter three, verse 23, St. Paul writes, for all have sinned and fall short the glory of God. What is Paul saying? For everybody has sinned. Everybody. That means, uh, what, does, what, does, what is sin? Well, I love the Old Testament definition of sin. See, the Old Testament concept of sin is called missing the mark. So imagine if you were shooting a bullseye with a bull, uh, with a with an arrow, okay, um, with a bow and arrow, 
and you're required to hit the bullseye every single time you launch an arrow. Now, is that possible? Well, sin, the concept of sin is called missing the mark. What that means is that from the moment you were born until the day you die, you cannot miss the mark. You have to be perfect. Can anybody do that? That's why Paul says, for all have sinned and fall short the glory of God. Friends, we cannot earn it. We cannot earn our ways to have. We cannot earn forgiveness. We cannot earn it. We have to learn that spiritual truth from children. We are dependent upon God. We cannot earn it. We cannot earn our way to heaven. It doesn't work that way. In God's eyes, anyone who sins is a sinner, will never be good enough. Our actions cannot merit enough goodness. God demands perfection. And so, it is, so heaven is not for sale. There's no sale sign. It cannot be bought. It cannot be earned. Secondly, it is a gift for everyone. Just like a child who, bel- who, who understands that there's, he cannot earn anything, but he can only receive. Friends, salvation and forgiveness, it is a gift for everyone. It is a gift. A gift is something that you receive. I grew up in, at Holy Spirit in a large um, youth group. I remember getting into discussion about with this uh, uh, you know, kids, we were kids at the time, about the nature of salvation, that it is a gift. A gift is something that's free of charge. We didn't merit it or did we earn it? Well, what happened is that there's this guy that said, well, I'm not sure it's, fr- it's free because I still have to believe. Well, but listen to this. What if you were to, what if you, what if you ha- were in debt a million dollars and you realize there is no way you can pay back that amount of money? All the debt collectors are coming. Um, you're in big trouble. Well, for some reason, um, let's say, example, Elon Musk finds out about your situation. He realizes that uh, you're in a very tough situation and he decides to write you a check for a million dollars. Now, you have this check. You have, to, you have to sign your name, take it to the bank, or you can sign your name, um, you know, put it, use your mobile phone, deposit it. I mean, is that work? Is signing your name and, and, and depositing a check work? Would you cry and say, well, it's not free, you know, a million dollars, that's not free. I have to put in so much work to, to sign the check and also, de- uh, you know, take a picture on, on my phone or, or take it to the bank. Friends, it doesn't work that way. It is a gift. Just signing a check has n- is not, you know, it, it, you can't compare that with, with the amount of money that you're given. Salvation is like that. It is a gift from God. St. Paul writes, For all have sinned and fall short the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And therefore forgiveness is through Jesus. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. One time, um, Jesus told a story, a story about a tax collector. Now, by the way, a tax collector is a traitor, a low life in ancient Jewish, du- Jewish society. A tax collector was a Jewish man or, you know, a Jewish man collecting taxes for the hated Romans. That's why they are called traitors. Now, not only are they called traitors, but that their testimonies were not accepted in the court of law. They were considered a category of robbers. Well, why? Well, because their salaries are based on what they charge 
in addition to what is required. So if they were required to collect $10,000 in, uh, in taxes for the region, well, they'll overcharge you so that they can make a living themselves. And so they were free to charge, overcharge whatever they wanted. In fact, they could stop you and they can tax you. They could, would overinflate the value of your property to charge more taxes. And so these were the scumbags of society. Nobody would take on this type of work unless you are a lowlife and are a lover of money. You could not care. And that's why we always find that when, you know, when Jesus, uh, when Jesus hangs out with tax collectors, there are also sinners or prostitutes that are associated with them. And so these were the low lives of society. So here's this tax collector. He comes to church, but he, he keeps his head down. He's crying. He's crying out to God. He wouldn't get close to the altar. He's beating his chest and he's crying out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but yet he cries out. He realizes there's nothing he could do to earn his way to heaven. He realizes that he could not earn it. And so Jesus, this is what Jesus said at the end of this parable, I mean story. He says, I tell you that this man went home justified before God. Justified meaning declared without sin, forgiven, which means he has a place in heaven. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Friends, this person realized he couldn't earn it, but humbled himself before God. And because he humbled himself before God, he knew what he needed. He needed salvation. And so what he received was forgiveness and salvation. Did he do something to deserve it? No. No. He couldn't, okay? He received it as a gift. Jesus says, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus continues in verse four. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. See, humbleness is valued in the kingdom of heaven. So like a child, a child is dependent upon, uh, um, you know, adults. We are dependent on God for, for, for protection, for forgiveness, for security, for peace, for joy. We're dependent upon God. And there's one thing that he really values. It is humbleness in his kingdom. Augustine, the great Christian uh, theologian, was once at, was asked the question, what are the most important things about the Christian faith? Augustine says there are three. Number one, humility. Number two, humility. Number three, humility. There's nothing more important than that. C.S. Lewis in the books A Mere Christianity writes, if we were to meet a truly humble person, Lewis says, we would never come away from meeting them thinking they were humble. They would not be always telling us they were a nobody because a person who keeps saying they are a nobody is actually self-obsessed. The thing we would remember from meeting a truly gospel humble person is how much they seem to be totally interested in us. Because the essence of the gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself, it is thinking of myself less. So what he's saying is that if you truly meet a humble person, you won't, you won't realize that this person is just bashing themselves, but rather you'll realize that that person is really interested in you they will ask questions about you and your life and are interested in what's going on in your life. And so, so he defines humbleness as humbleness is not thinking less of yourself or you know, looking down upon yourself, 
but thinking less of yourself it means our mind is focused on serving other people. When the disciples were arguing again, you know, this, this thing came up. It was getting old, okay? It came up again on the night that Jesus was about to be betrayed. Judas had already, the devil had already took a hold of him. He, are, he are already left he are, he, to set up a time and place to, to betray Jesus. So now the disciples are like arguing again. Again, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? For some reason, they were convinced. They were convinced this was going to happen again. Jesus was going to take the throne. And so they're fighting, they're arguing. While they're arguing and fighting, Jesus doesn't yell at them. He doesn't say, stop it, knock it off. He didn't tell them, do you know I, my time with you is very short. Can you just, can you just enjoy this time or, or, or you know, be at peace? No. While they're arguing, they're preoccupied by being arguing over who's the best, he went over. He took a servant's towel. He poured water in a basin. He goes over to, to, to them one by one. He begins to wash their feet. Wow, wait. Do you understand the significance of this? Here is the creator of the universe and his hands are holding the feet of the, his creation. He's holding their filthy, dirty feet. In ancient times, they wore sandals. They walked on a lot of unpaved roads. Roads shared by animals, which means they're dung. And so their feet would stink. It would smell with dirt, manure, and who knows what else. And so Jesus takes these feet. He begins to wash them one feet, one foot at a time. And he washes the feet of every one of his disciples. Instead of yelling at them, he shows them what humble service means. It's you. It's about you. Let me bring this uh, to a close here. When Billy Graham was 94 years old, um, they, were, they were planning his uh, funeral. During the planning, uh, Michael W. Smith was there, uh, the singer Michael W. Smith. And so Michael W. Smith was summoned by Billy Graham. Uh, he, at the time, he was confined to a, real, uh, a wheelchair. Uh, he was on oxygen, but he was still very, very sharp, still very joyful. And so when Michael came over, he said he wanted to discuss his funeral. And he said he had a request. Of course, he said, anything you want, what is it? This is the great Billy Graham. Of course, uh, anything he wants, what is it? Billy Graham said, would you not mention my name? What? He said it again. Could you not mention my name? Just mention the name of Jesus. Wow. Here is this guy who was a spiritual advisor to, to half a decade of presidents. He's filled stadiums, preached the gospel to a billion people, and yet in his funeral, he doesn't want to be named. My dear friends in Christ, humbleness is valued in the kingdom. Before God, we cannot earn our salvation. We need to understand that. We'll, we'll never be good enough. God demands perfection. We'll never measure up. It's received as a gift. It is a gift for everyone by faith. Jesus died on the cross and paid for our sins. So the gift of heaven is a gift. It's receiving it like a child. A child knows he cannot earn it. A child can only receive. We cannot earn our salvation before God. We can only receive it. And because the child is humble, the humbleness is valued in the kingdom. May God richly bless you and strengthen you. Amen. Please join me for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son Jesus who demonstrated to us what humbleness really is. We ask that you will give us childlike faith, childlike humbleness, 
so that when we come before you, we can see and be grateful for what you have done for all of us. Lord, we thank you for loving us, for doing so much for us. We thank you for reminding us that without you, we are nothing. But because we have you, we are the apple of your eyes. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We continue to pray for the victims of the Maui fire. We also pray for those in Florida who uh, have been affected by the hurricanes. Lord, we ask that you, wa that you will watch over our family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Together we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen.